everyone. Welcome back to our IVF webinar once again. It's great to be here once more with all of you. And uh, it's good to be back with Dr. Diana. And she is with us once again. If you don't know already, Dr. Diana has been a frequent uh, presenter. And it's always, always great to have you back here. Hello, Dr. Diana. How are you feeling? I'm feeling so good and excited about uh, the opportunity to have uh, the presentation once again. Thank you so much uh, for you know uh, coming for co for coming to uh, and hear our presentation. Thank you so much. I'm pretty anxious to have this presentation today. Definitely, we are excited to have you back. Okay, uh, it's always, always great to have you for sure. And I just want to mention that uh, Dr. Diana, if you don't know already, Dr. Diana Obinek, she is the head of uh, Art of Birth Clinic, which is located in St. Petersburg. So um, far away, and it's already a little bit later for you. But um, if you don't know, Dr. Diana has been doing webinars even at 3 p.m., uh, sorry, a.m. Um, so in the middle of the night, she was with us. So as you can imagine, uh, she's always, always eager to help out. And it doesn't matter what, what time it is. So <laughs> it's really nice to have you here. And as always, she has brought a great presentation. So uh, we will discuss IVF failure tonight and she will explain all the details. But afterwards, remember, it will be time for your questions. So all you need to do is just type those in the chat section. And Dr. Diana, of course, will uh, answer them for you. And thank you so much for joining us tonight. I think it's time to go uh, with the presentation. Right, Dr. Diana? Sure. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And let's go ahead. So, our dear guests, uh, today we will talk about IVF and recurrent implantation failure. To say the truth, sir, I'm a fan of medicine and reproductive medicine is uh, the part of medicine which is for me the most interesting because uh, recurrent implantation failure and IVF technology in general, it's one of the most, um, you know, uh, areas of medicine with the highest spread of development. So now we will, today we will talk about our definition, our understanding of recurrent implantation failure and our uh, opportunities to fix it. I would like to share with you just a brief uh, explanation of uh, what is Art of Birth Clinic, because for me it's also like a child. Uh, the Art of Birth Clinic is a modern clinic, but our team uh, is the well, a well-known team uh, across the world because we have started to work together about nine years ago. So now we are located in the very center of St. Petersburg, in the heart of uh, historical center of St. Petersburg. And uh, we created a specific project because uh, the, this Art of Birth Clinic, it's uh, the base for, uh, um, it's a university, kind of university clinic. We collaborate with three main universities in Russia. So we provide not only fertility treatment, but also heart scientific work on IVF. I was mad about clinic, which is so cozy that everybody feel uh, that they are in home, not only physicians, nurses, and all the staff, but also and the patients. For us, the main player, the main person in clinic is our patient. That's why I wanted to create the atmosphere which would be unique and very, very calm. So we are so-called specialized in the toughest cases. There, are, we can uh, we can articulate it because our work uh, from we started about nine years ago. So, and by this moment, we have patent for algorithm of, in management of recurrent implantation failure, severe endometriosis, and poor ovarian reserve. These are 
topics which are usually considered to be the most difficult in um, in treatment, but we have great experience and very good result. We also have the larger genetic lab, uh, lab net in Russia called medical genomics. We also work in international international mode uh, concern in mode of uh, genetics. We have so-called guarantee packages. It's our you know uh, key specialization because we understand that sometimes after many uh, many ineffective attempts, words from the team, words from the physician are not enough to persuade that we do our best, that we are also very interested only in positive results. That's why we created guarantee packages when we guarantee that the pregnancy occurs in three attempts or we continue our treatment without any financial additional expenses. Uh, it was the first time when patients uh, heard these uh, so-called guaranteed packages, but now I know that many patients just recommend it because they know that this is the phone of calmness. They know that uh, if they rely on, the, on our expertise, uh, they will win. So, as I have already told, uh, we started our dive into recurrent implantation failure nine years ago. It was 2012. I started my fundamental study. Uh, I faced so many patients with ineffective IVF attempts that I determined that I will dedicate, you know, all my time, energy, energy and inspiration to create a proved practical guideline. Uh, by this moment, we already have these guidelines and these logistics, and we have, even that we have very tough cases and very difficult patients, the average success rate is close to 80% for one embryo transfer. I know that it's a very high rate, and sometimes I have a lot of suspicious, uh, you know, speech about uh, uh, our statistics, but this statistics is open and uh, the best um, the approval of our outcome is the pictures of our babies. As we are the, not only a practical center but also scientific center, I'm very proud of our work, um, of our results in scientific mode. So by this time, my team has four international awards from American Society for Reproductive Medicine, two patents for invention, and viable protocol of treatment patients with recurrent implantation failure. Our secret in brief, and that's how I, you know, I start my lessons with students, that each intended parent, each patient is a book. And we should go throughout this treatment chapter by chapter. You know, our main aim is to make uh, you pregnant and to give you a healthy baby. But this is the huge task. This is the huge idea. That's why we should just uh, divide it into small pieces and fix each piece till we get the result we want. So we do not go to the next part without making previous one done. One embryo transfer, one healthy baby. But as we move uh, throughout the book, we should start with introduction. I would like to share with you some uh, brief words about how does it work. The very beginning of your pregnancy starts with the implantation. It's the process of delicate interaction between the embryo and the endometrium. And just nine years ago, uh, when we started, it was like a great invention and uh, the great opening. Uh, we got the information uh, that cumulus cells, microenvironment, and various growth factors uh, play an important role 
contributing or hindering successful nidation. Because before this data, uh, all the investigators, all the physicians worldwide, I knew that there are just two players, the embryo and the endometrium. But now we know that there are much more players. We know that concomitant pathology also uh, play a great role in contributing the pregnancy or hindering this, uh, elevating this, uh, the risk for uh, miscarriage or ineffective implantation. So let us go from the chapter one, the embryo. I want you to know that unfortunately human beings are we are specific with the rate of aneuploidy in the embryo. Even in the uh, very good age, uh, when we are very young, we know that just half of our embryos are abnormal. Uh, I want to share with you a very, very well-known slide from the Eximate Congress, which was held in 2017, about prevalence of aneuploidy and morphological evaluation of embryos. I bet you know that uh, there is classification, which is international, international classification of embryos, which when we assess morphological appearance of the embryos. Maybe you know that there are uh, figures and letters, for example, 4AA, 3BB. Uh, that's why we know what is the quality from morphological appearance of the embryo. That's why we are uh, trying to make uh, our speech very uh, easy for understanding for our patients. We call the embryos excellent, good, or average or poor quality embryos. So what I want to say is that even among the embryos of so-called excellent quality, just 56% of them are normal. And close to 45% are abnormal with single or diet, uh, double aneuploid or with complex aneuploid. Uh, anyway, all the abnormal embryos are not recommended for uh, embryo transfer. If we transfer abnormal embryo, uh, we can uh, we know three alternatives of, of, uh, of uh, the possible results. The first one, we just have no pregnancy. And for sure, it's a very dramatic situation, but unfortunately, uh, the result can be even worse. For example, the pregnancy starts, but it has to be interrupted because it has because the fetus has some medical indications which are uh, not possible, uh, uh, which are not correlated with normal being. Sometimes pregnancy stops itself when it has genetic abnormalities in the embryo. So what can we do? For sure, we have to uh, have to recommend pre-implantation genetic testing. By this time, PGTA, pre-implantation genetic testing of embryos, is uh, just widespread uh, technology. It's very safe, and we make it just in ninety percent of our cases. But it's very interesting that uh, even several years ago. Uh, everybody, all the fertility specialists, uh, considered that well, we shouldn't recommend pre-implantation genetic testing in egg donation program because egg donation uh, can uh, facilitate good result. We know that uh, a donor of uh, eggs are, uh, are approved from the from their genetic status. In our clinic, we also inquire that. The egg, uh, egg donor uh, has uh, her own baby uh, who is healthy, but unfortunately, it doesn't guarantee good result in our fertilization and our development of the embryos. I would like to represent you uh, one very interesting trial called Major Factors Involving an Implantation Rate of PGTA Euploid Embryos in Egg Donation Program Over 35 Years Old. Uh, the investigators uh, compared two groups, the group 1, 182 egg donation program with PGTA, and group B, uh, 58 egg donation program without PGT. Uh, for sure, these um, uh, 
uh, these groups are not similar in their number but uh, however as we have enough number of uh, programs to evaluate we can rely on this result so in group a implantation rate was 46 percent it's not that high taken into account that it's uh, an egg donation program but in group b uh, the uh, investigation uh, the investigators demonstrated just 20 percent of implantation rate so we know that when we implement pre-implantation genetic testing even in egg donation uh, program we see better results we see double elevation of implantation rate in our clinic, we always recommend pre-implantation genetic testing and only in very young person we do not make it. So usually it's close to 90%. But also we are uh, talking about factors which play a role and contribute um, other, uh, contribute. Uh, the role in the result uh, in uh, the result of our uh, of morphology of the embryos we should take into the account sperm morphology because for sure male factor plays a great role so uh, I would like to share with you another trial evaluation of the impact of sperm morphology on embryo so according to this uh, to the data, we know that diminished sperm quality is correlated to the aneuploidy rate in pre-implantation embryo. That's why even when we make egg donation program and we have uh, heart, uh, heart defects in sperm, we always have to recommend pre-implantation genetic testing to select the good embryo and prevent implantation of uh, abnormal embryo. So by this time, talking about good clinical practice, for sure we should select, select and select once again the embryo. Unfortunately, by this time, uh, we cannot fix the genetic problems in the embryo. So we have nothing to do except select the good one embryo, which can produce good pregnancy and healthy baby. Uh, we have several means to select the perfect baby, a perfect embryo. Uh, the first line is so-called embryoscope, it's time-lapse cultivation of embryos. It means uh, that this is a specific incubator when we have uh, no need to take the embryo uh, outside this incubator to assess this, its morphology. It's very, very important invention because nowadays we can make uh, observation of the development of the embryo just without any um, any risk for, for the embryo and we can make it with any stops because uh, uh, the, uh, inside this incubator there is a camera uh, which makes uh, shots of the embryo and, and makes uh, uh, pictures with uh, just uh, every five or seven minutes. That's why then we make uh, we have a video uh, where we share you know, with this uh, with our patient this video to uh, assess how the embryo develops. Also, we use pre-implantation genetic testing uh, of the embryos uh, and pre-implantation genetic testing on monogenic diseases. For example, uh, patients with mucoviscidosis uh, or hemophilia, uh, now we can choose the embryo without this career. Also, uh, in, our, uh, in our clinic, we are mad about artificial intellect. Uh, that's why we have several systems of control to provide uh, just control non-stop of our quality of quality of our practice uh, we uh, we have implemented uh, embryoscope also so-called array witness uh, when we um, array witness system is a system of control which provides um, a guarantee that we uh, use biological material or the couple because all the biological material uh, is uh, marked with specific uh, with specific metrics then if uh, uh, for some reasons because uh, uh, all over the world uh, embryologists are human beings and they for sure have a, a 
tiny uh, chance to uh, make a mistake, artificial intellect will catch this moment and prevent any mistake in our work. For sure, after such a great selection, uh, we uh, insist on transferring just one embryo because uh, our aim is to have healthy baby. When we talk about multiple pregnancy, we know that according to very long experience uh, in obstetrician and gynecology, according to all the available literature and our uh, experience, we know that multiple pregnancy is always associated with elevated risk both for baby uh, and for mother. That's why uh, when we transfer two embryos, we uh, prevent, uh, we, we elevate this risk with our own hands. We always uh, insist on transferring just one embryo. Chapter 2, endometria. I want to share with you the history of endometrium because, uh, um, you know, 10 years ago, endometrium was considered as a player or the second role. And uh, usually, uh, with many persons uh, thought that embryo is just uh, the only uh, the only point which is responsible for uh, get pregnant or not get pregnant of uh, the result of this pregnancy. But nowadays, we understand that endometrium uh, is a micro microenvironment, uh, and it plays a great role of biosensor of embryo quality. So in normal life, naturally, uh, all the we or all women have uh, an ability uh, to assess the embryo inside yourself and uh, uh, and assess uh, the quality of the embryo. If the embryo is good, uh, all the uh, capabilities uh, of uh, women are inclined to make. Uh, successful in, uh, implantation. However, if the embryo in natural life is abnormal, because as I have told, 50% of our embryos unfortunately are abnormal. Uh, we have uh, such quality as selectivity, so endometrium prevents implantation of abnormal uh, embryo. Usually, in normal situation, receptivity and selectivity are in fragile balance. But unfortunately, when we have some functional or morphological alterations of endometrium, this function also suffers. And then we see if we have uh, elevated receptivity and diminished selectivity, it results in uh, recurrent, uh, recurrent uh, pregnancy loss. So woman accepts all the embryos she produces, even if the embryo if, is abnormal. But the pregnancy is already uh, has a bad prognosis and usually stops. Uh, from the other hand, if selectivity is uh, too elevated, receptivity is diminished, and then we see recount implantation failure or fertility or infertility. So, what are the morphological alterations of endometrium? Because uh, till until uh, recent time, uh, the main alterations of endometrium were considered to be morphological. And we discussed chronic endometritis, hyperplastic process, and uh, intrauterine synechia. Chronic endometritis is a condition involving the breakdown of the peaceful coexistence between microorganisms and the host immune system in the endometrium, resulting in a special type of chronic inflammation in the endometrium characterized by non-apparent clinical signs. What does it mean? Because there are too many words I would like to explain you. So normally, uh, let us tell the truth, that normally we do not pay too much attention to our menstrual bleeding. But it's, uh, you know, the metrics of functioning, uh, of uh, competence of our uterus, of our endometrium. When we have uh, chronic endometritis, so inflammation in the endometrium it doesn't provide any pain or elevated temperature so we do not absorb uh, general inflammation in our body but we see that as a chronic process it uh, results in some outcomes usually there are 
some morphological uh, changes, for example, micropolyps or cyanide here, uh, you would never notice that. But you will notice that your menstrual bleeding quality changes. For example, uh, the bleeding becomes more brownish. Uh, you see that uh, menstrual bleeding lasts not normally uh, as a normal situation three or four days, but five or six days, and uh, the last days are not that um, uh, uh, not uh, that intensive, but they are more brownish and some, sometimes they even um, close to be black. But these are the signs of chronic endometritis. Uh, when we talk about the prevalence of chronic endometritis, for sure it depends on the study group. For example, in general population it's not that high, it's just uh, approximately 10%. But if we will dive into tough cases, for example, several ineffective IVF attempts, uh, we will find chronic endometritis is 30%. When we talk about recurrent implantation failure with good quality of transferred embryos, chronic endometritis will be uh, identified in 60% of cases. For sure, the group of risk are recurrent implantation failure and recurrent pregnancy loss. In group with recurrent pregnancy loss, we observe chronic endometritis in most patients in 66%. So for sure, our treatment, uh, our, our treatment plan uh, should include diagnosis of chronic endometritis. And if we verify this diagnosis, for sure, we should prepare and we should treat chronic endometritis and prepare endometrium properly. Uh, I always um, uh, like to share with you a history, uh, you know, some history of medicine. It's very interesting that till 1957, we were totally persuaded that cavity of uterus normally is sterile. So there, uh, we uh, were persuaded that no microorganisms live inside the uterus. But now we know that it was just our misunderstanding because we just didn't have any tools to uh, diagnose and identify microorganisms. Uh, then when we had a culture method of diagnosis, we, know, we got the information that, wow, we have a lot of microorganisms inside. And now in the era of sequencing, we have uh, great understanding that uh, in uterus is not sterile at all and we have a lot of microorganisms and we have normal microbiome inside the uterus and abnormal ones. For sure, uterine microbiota plays a great role because your uterus is a home, it's an apartment for, for your uh, pregnancy. Uh, and you know, embryos, as I tell, uh, uh, they want good conditions from uh, human beings, uh, prefer good conditions uh, from the first day of their lives. That's why uh, if they don't like this apartment, if they find that uh, the condition inside are not good for, for the life, they will never implant. So, Inside the uterus, uh, the uterus, we consider we divide uh, all the microorganisms uh, into residents, tourists, and invaders. And for sure, for us, invaders are the most uh, risky group. Uh, by this time, we have a lot of trials. Uh, concerning microbiome in recurrent pregnancy loss and uh, microbiome in repeated implantation failure. Uh, there are a lot of uh, papers concerning uterine microbiota. Uh, they are rather difficult for understanding. That's why I would like to share with you in brief and uh, I will try to explain you how does it work. So uh, there are a lot of microorganisms but uh, normally we have so-called lactobacil dominant uh, mode of uh, microbiome. So 
uh, if uh, the dominant uh, uh, dominant microbiome consists from lactobacil is a good situation and we have all the conditions for good implantation but sometimes uh, specifically in inflammation uh, we have another microorganism which uh, starts which concentration uh, uh, prevails uh, than uh, lactobacil domain uh, than lactobacils uh, that's why uh, implantation doesn't occur but by this time we uh, our team works on so-called uh, microbiome individualized treatment because uh, for sure usually all the inflammations are treated with antibiotics unfortunately as uh, old people have uh, a lot of indications to take antibiotics now we have to discuss the the real problem of uh, resistance for antibiotics that's why sometimes antibiotics just just uh, don't work and new era of uh, big pharma of uh, medications are associated with a new tool with regenerative medicine with uh, um, creating a treatment uh, from your own microbiome and uh, when we place normal microbiome created uh, from your uh, your specific uh, microorganism which are natural for you and then uh, create a normal uh, normal conditions in your uterus uh, i hope that by the end of this year we will present uh, this technology we already have some uh, great cases i will share i will uh, share with you one of them by, uh, in the end of uh, the presentation but for sure uh, it's still on the uh, trial stage uh, that's why uh, i hope that by the end of this year we will present you great results and maybe new pattern for invention from the other hand we have functional alterations so-called compromised window uh, implantation window the thing is that in uh, natural life the embryo development and the uh, receptivity of uh, endometrium are synchronized, uh, are synchronized that's why if the processes of, of embryo development and uh, reaching of maximal receptivity of endometrium are desynchronized uh, we never obtain a good pregnancy by this time we have uh, already two commercial uh, tests from Spain and from uh, Estonia I think uh, which are, are called error test and be ready test uh, they both provide uh, work on the same technology uh, they give us uh, the personalized perfect time for embryo transfer and it uh, results in great outcome for example these are data from spanish uh, team uh, from my genomics so this is the error test it's uh, a little bit more expensive than uh, be ready test but uh, they have just very similar results and we use uh, and implement in our practice both of these methods so um, please pay your attention to the figures on the slide so there were three uh, uh groups of comparison with frozen embryo transfer uh, with fresh embryo transfer and so-called personalized embryo transfer uh, the number of embryo transfer was close to two so 1.7 so sometimes uh, they transferred two embryos sometimes they transferred one embryo but uh, they tried uh, we see the tendency to transfer also just one embryo CPR uh, it means clinical pregnancy uh, rate per embryo transfer so we see that when uh, this uh, group uh, when uh, this team of investigators uh, implemented frozen embryo transfer the result was 61 percent fresh embryo transfer 60 percent but when they use personalized embryo transfer the CPR clinical pregnancy rate was 85 percent 
it's a great result i love uh, this idea and um, my team was the first uh, team um, who started uh, this uh, personalized embryo transfer in russia because we collaborating with uh, the most uh, difficult patients and we had just uh, imagine uh, just uh, be, uh, impressive outcome because uh, the first patient was uh, with uh, eight embryo transfers uh, with PGTA from uh, different clinics, but they ne uh, this, uh, that couple never had positive pregnancy tests. And we just made one test because she had a lot of lab tests. Uh, she um, had physicians from different countries, so uh, she really uh, went through the dramatic history. And we have performed just one test, and then we performed embryo transfer, which resulted in, uh, in pregnancy. And the pregnancy went very, very good with no complications, no risk, and uh, great delivery with healthy boy. So it was the first case. And then we have just uh, uh, 10 or 11 cases so with, uh, uh, you know, 100% result. That's why I remember the statistics. I love uh, that test. Now it's our routine practice, and we use uh, personalized embryo transfer uh, very very often i would like to uh, demonstrate how it does uh, uh, look like uh, the report it's not error test it be ready test but um, the idea is uh, uh, very uh, very close so uh, we see uh, this scale of uh, uh, we see this scale of uh, receptivity and the normal uh, the normal rate is 100 100 point the normal score if we have more than 100 as on the first picture uh, we consider this post receptive endometrium so it was uh, we should make embryo transfer a bit earlier if we have uh, uh, less than 100% score, we consider that endometrium is pre-receptive. So we should make embryo transfer later uh, than uh, it was the sample performed. Uh, I think uh, it's one of the uh, tests which could be hard, uh, hardly overestimated. We really use it very often and it uh, helps us very much. Uh, talking about concomitant pathology, for sure, when we talk about recurrent implantation failure, we cannot uh, avoid um, some points about hereditary thrombophilia, because uh, uh, inside we also have trends like you know in, fas in fashion. For example, uh, when we talk about hereditary thrombophilia, we know that when uh, the study started in 2006 uh, there was a, a reflection that hereditary thrombophilia always results in recurrent implantation failure or problems with pregnancy and uh, everybody uh, thought that two or more thrombophilia factors affect in 2012 uh, we had more information and then we understand that if there is just one isolated factor, for example, uh, autoantibodies for just one factor, it really doesn't uh, make uh, any effect and it doesn't make uh, uh, any clue to make a great treatment and preparation for that. By this time, we know that only factor 5 mutation, MTHFR, homozygous mutation, uh, make a great result and make a great impact on our out outcome. All others are not that significant. Factors associated with, immunologic, uh, with immunology. For sure, uh, antiphospholipid syndrome uh, is one of the uh, difficult conditions, but uh, it's a rare situ rather rare situation. But we know that according to a systematic review of 29 studies, uh, which included more than 5,000 patients, we know that APS increased threefold the risk of failure of implantation. 
But the good news is that we know how to treat it. Uh, we know how to fix it and prevent these uh, bad outcomes. So the idea is to uh, verify the right diagnosis. Because sometimes uh, I, I know that um, I'm an auditor of uh, some clinics in Russia and uh, abroad, and I know that sometimes we observe hyperdiagnosis of IPS uh, because uh, there are very strict uh, uh, instructions and indications when we can uh, verify APS syndrome. Uh, we have to make several tests, not only just one positive test of uh, uh, antibodies, uh, for antibodies, but uh, we have to repeat this uh, test because sometimes they are uh, false positive. Uh, so by this moment, uh, I know that we can fix APS, we can uh, fix complications associated with APS in most cases, but sometimes we uh, see uh, that we have to neglect this diagnosis and additional uh, diagnosis test uh, tells us that uh, there is no APS uh, syndrome in uh, certain cases. So please uh, be uh, very accurate. Also, uh, unverified celiac disease and autoimmune thyroiditis also plays a, a great role in the implantation failure. And uh, that's why, for example, uh, we have very strong, fruitful collaboration with a specialist uh, on uh, endocrinology and dietology. Um, most uh, of our patients have at least one or two consultation with dietologists uh, because it's not the idea that everybody have to lose weight. You know, sometimes when I just pronounce uh, the uh, name of uh, a specialization, dietologist, everybody think that uh, we want to uh, we want to uh, we insist on uh, losing weight. But no, we are trying to make our regimen of. Uh, um, taking food more healthy uh, because we are the food, you know, we are what we eat. Uh, that's why for uh, by this moment we know that uh, our food, our habits on taking food are associated with microbiome and microbiome produce uh, uh, the complication in our health. Also, according to our algorithm, after embryo transfer, we always make screening tests on TSH to control the function of our theory, because uh, um, there are strong data, strong evidence data that, that after embryo transfer, when we have implantation, we see that the function of our theory um, uh, alters and uh, this uh, uh, it uh, it lasts just a very short period of time but uh, it can result uh, in uh, so-called um, biochemical or molar pregnancy because uh, uh, this alteration in theory result in um, miscarriage at very early stage so we uh, by this time we have implemented screening tests on TSH the second or third day after embryo transfer. So we control, and if there is a high levels of TSH, we fix it and uh, prescribe additional medications. Also, for sure, factors associated with gametes and embryo. Uh, our technology are strongly associated with the quality of uh, um, gametes of all sites and spermatozoa. That's why there are a lot of trials and investigations trying to make uh, to enhance the quality of all sites. Unfortunately, the science doesn't give us uh, strong uh, um, strong technology to enhance the all sites. That's why we know that time in reproductive area. Is a, is a crucial point. But uh, nowadays we know uh, and we have the technology when we uh, make uh, so-called nuclear embryo transfers, uh, which can uh, prolong a bit uh, biological age of the woman. Also, um, male factor, precisely DNA fragmentation, um, 
several years ago, uh, nobody uh, took into their account seriously DNA fragmentation uh, because uh, there were different methods of assessment and the results of these methods were very different and they didn't correlate it to uh, didn't correlate to each other. But now we know that DNA fragmentation is strongly associated with recurrent pregnancy loss. And even uh, now it's under discussion to uh, make uh, the definition of recurrent pregnancy loss of, of the term of recurrent pregnancy loss for men uh, when uh, different women uh, getting pregnant with one man result in miscarriage. So the key factor contributing to this uh, unbeneinful outcome is the elevated DNA fragmentation uh, in sperm. Conclusion. Conclusion is when you take your healthy baby home. Uh, my my team and my students make jokes so that uh, you know uh, I always uh, make KPI that uh, in normal in the usual practice uh, we measure clinical pregnancy rate and I'm met of uh, a live birth rate. I always tell, uh, tell that uh, my work is done when uh, my patients take their babies home. So my students make jokes that uh, several years after I will tell that my work will be done when uh, all my babies, uh, babies of my patient will, uh, you know, uh, graduate the school with uh, A, uh, only with A and will be and will have a great IQ results on the IQ test. But I would like to uh, share with you some case report because I uh, uh, I think that case report with good outcomes are very inspiring and give us uh, inspiration, hope, and uh, strength to fight till the end. Uh, the first case is... Uh, uh, one of my, you know, favorite ones. Uh, the case uh, that tells us uh, that fertility specialist is not about IVF. Fertility specialist is about uh, your uh, solution, solution of your problem. Uh, I had a, a patient, 39 years old. Uh, as uh, I'm a specialist uh, with, uh, you know, who is inclined on patients with recurrent implantation failure, most of my patients have, have a dramatical history of ineffective attempts in their medical history. So I'm never the first physician. Um, I, uh, it's a rare situation when I perform the first IVF for patients. Usually they already have a lot of in their history. So... Uh, 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 this uh, woman had eight embryo transfer, all with pre-implantation genetic testing, and she never had positive a pregnancy test. We performed hysteroscopy. She had very severe form of endometriosis, so we had a long period of treatment, of conservative treatment of endometriosis. And then uh, I've asked her, to uh, give me three months because I wanted and I've insisted on trying natural pregnancy for sure. I've conducted them. I've made uh, I've made ultrasound scans, and you know uh, I'm even told when they uh, it's better to uh, make sexual intercourse. But we had natural pregnancy for sure. We made non-invasive uh, uh, prenatal test because uh, she was 39 years old. Uh, she was uh, 39 years old, so uh, we uh, took into the account that we had elevated risk of genetic disorders in embryos, but uh, 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 non-invasive tests uh, described that everything is good, and we had good delivery. So uh, that's why when our work and uh, sometimes uh, it's about that sometimes the problem is very tiny, and we do not need to make a lot of work. We just need to find the problem and fix it. And sometimes we even don't need to uh, make IVF. But for sure, it's a rare situation. Another point, another case report. Uh, it's a, I call her champion. It's my champion. Uh, she was 41 years old. 
she had 27 embryo transfers and she had severe endometriosis and chronic endometritis with severe activity and even autoimmune component. She had multiple recommendations for egg donation and surrogacy program and she even tried egg donation but uh, there was no result and uh, she came to me with no hope. She just wanted to try everything. Uh, we made uh, stimulation with own egg uh, program with following PGTA. Then we made hysteroscopy. Now we deleted a lot of micropolyps. Uh, then there was a conservative treatment of chronic endometritis and delayed frozen thought embryo transfer in natural cycle with PRP therapy. I always prefer to make embryo transfer in natural cycle, though I always mention that uh, in, uh, according to multiple trials, uh, uh, there is no difference uh, in, uh, in outcome, in success. Uh, but I prefer to make a natural cycle when possible because uh, we can diminish our intervention when we can not prescribe uh, any hormones or any tablets, I always try not to prescribe it. The result was a clinical pregnancy and delivery with healthy boy. Uh, to say the truth, our first attempt, it was her 28 embryo transfer, was also positive, but uh, she had a panic attack because she wasn't psychologically ready for positive results. She had uh, 11 or 12 years of uh, consistent fertility treatment with no result and when she just had positive uh, result with very good figures it was uh, about 105 uh, 1500 uh, hcg she just had panic attack and unfortunately uh, she couldn't fix it and we had miscarriage but the clinical pregnancy it was uh, our second attempt uh, we were very close and I always have very close uh, relationships with patients so uh, in my uh, in my imagination uh, she was she were close to leaving my home but for me it was also uh, very calm <laughs> very calm situation so we had clinical pregnancy and delivery with healthy boy in 2018 and when it was pandemic in 2020 uh, when we were allowed to make embryo transfer because for some months so we just restricted uh, all our practice and we um, did our best to fix the pandemic in Russia when we were allowed to make uh, uh, to recover from this and make embryo transfer I heard uh, uh, 29 September uh, was also successful and it's a girl. Thank you for your time. I'm ready to answer all your questions. Take care of yourselves. Together we are stronger. I love uh, this uh, incentive from IVF answers and uh, I always, uh, um, in the end, I always tell that together we are stronger. I do believe uh, in uh, this slogan. Thank you. Thank you indeed, Dr. Diana. What can I say after such presentation once more? Because of course, it's always brilliant to have you here and amazing presentation as always. So there's nothing else to add really. Um, and uh, I love that you always bring some uh, cases, real cases, patient cases. It's always wonderful to see that even if there are like 28, uh, 29 IVF attempts, that sounds like really scary, but it works. So thanks a lot. This is amazing. And as you can see, there are play, plenty of questions for you already, as always. So thank you so much, everyone, for your questions. And now let's get to them straight away. So first question, if embryos are tested and of good quality, what is the possibility of unsuccessful implantation if surrogate is healthy, young, and gave birth already? Well, if we talk about, uh, thank you for a question. If we talk about surrogacy program, 
uh, we always ex uh, we uh, always uh, expect very high percent of result. So uh, successful implantation rate in surrogacy when we have already approved embryo trans uh, embryo uh, it's close to 80 percent to 85 percent uh, per one embryo transfer. Unfortunately, we uh, cannot provide more than 80 percent because unfortunately in this area uh, there is room for you know discussion and uh, we still don't know everything but we uh, expect very high percent so it's one of the uh, program when we guarantee uh, pregnancy in three attempts in any way so we expect very very high percent of success uh, DNA test is good so yes for sure it's uh, we uh, we expect very good prognosis it's a very small chance uh, that uh, it, uh, something goes wrong and uh, implantation will not occur thank you so much Bisso, for your question and your follow-up and of course some additional information and dr diana for your help with that and of course Let's have a look, okay? Biso has added one more question. Let me go straight to this. Is it true that first time is not always successful? Well, yes, unfortunately, and uh, it's uh, our pay because to say the truth, uh, uh, I think uh, according to my reflections, I get or not get pregnant with each of my patients. And uh, as I have told, even uh, with such a great uh, success rate as uh, in our clinic, it's still not 100%. So for sure, it's more likely to be positive than negative because uh, even 10 years ago or still in some clinics in some regions, I know that a success rate is just you know 30 or 40%. So it's uh, uh, more likely to be negative than positive. It's not normal in uh, 2029. Now we talk that KPI for IVF clinic is uh, to provide not less than 65% uh, of uh, IVF success. So it's not for sure the guarantee of uh, have uh, good result from the first attempt. But we have a lot of chances and a lot of opportunities to help you from the first attempt. And it's our aim. One embryo transfer, one healthy baby. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much once more. And there's a thank you from Lisa for you right here. And the next question is, how do you treat chronic endometritis? Uh, one of our patterns are um, on uh, chronic endometritis because, because uh, for sure we can verify and approve chronic endometritis according to immunohistological um, examination. So it's not just biopsy of endometrium, we should examine it properly. And we have uh, uh, the scale which is approved and we have the pattern for the scale of assessment of chronic endometritis, which give us advanced uh, interpretation. We know uh, is it an active form of chronic endometritis or is a uh, uh, very long-going chronic endometritis. And depending on the type of morphological uh, uh, type of chronic endometritis, we have different algorithms of treatment. So sometimes if uh, the um, inflammation is, let us tell, fresh, so uh, it's very active, uh, we have to use uh, antibiotics. Sometimes when we talk about chronic endometritis, which, is, uh, uh, which uh, exists for many years, uh, we usually do not observe uh, uh, intensive activity. So our antibiotics uh, will do nothing but harm. Uh, that's why we usually implement PRP, uh, platelet-rich plasma therapy, uh, as a tool of regenerative method uh, to, um, to recover the endometrium. Uh, 
and I think that it's one of all the cases when it's better also to use uh, when we will have uh, the strong evidence for microbiome I'm sure that it will be the key solution for this situation but now we have different algorithms so the main idea if uh, the activity is very high we should uh, fix it we should diminish it uh, we diminish inflammation with anti-inflammation therapy antibiotics and sometimes we even make some injections with um, uh, activity or ferments and so on if it's a uh, long-existing inflammation we usually do not see any active microorganism. <clears throat> That's why we should fix uh, the outcome of this uh, inflammation. Cyanichia, uh, polyps, and we should work on it. Uh, usually, there are, uh, observe, we observe some fibroids uh, inside. That's why uh, there is no room for antibiotics in this situation. So the, the answer is <clears throat> that uh, we treat chronic endometritis individually, uh, not individually uh, for each case, but uh, uh, individually for each type of chronic endometritis. It's uh, the only uh, right, right method to say the truth. That makes perfect sense, of course. Thank you so much. And actually, um, another question from a different patient is again on chronic endometritis. So let's have a look. Okay. I no longer have periods now 48 uh, doing donor egg treatment in two months time. But when I had periods, I had the brown blood on the last few days of period. I had a MOX transfer late last year. Uterine lining developed fine. Anything you can advise? Yes, for sure. Uh uh, our recommendation to make uh, before embryo transfer the cycle, be the previous cycle or two cycle before your planning embryo transfer uh, hysteroscopy because uh, by this time it's the golden standard of uh, assessment of endometrium. Unfortunately, ultrasound diagnostic doesn't provide 100 objectivity and sensitivity, and we have so-called blind places in uterus when uh, which uh, cannot be uh, investigated by a routine ultrasound. That's why we should make a hysteroscopy and uh, prepare your uterus. Uh, I bet that given your the quality and uh, characteristics of your period uh, that you had previously uh, phys your physician will find some details uh, which should be fixed before embryo transfer after that uh, when preparing for embryo transfer for sure you will have menstrual bleeding it's uh, uh, one of the stages for preparation for embryo transfer I think that you will even notice the difference between the quality of uh, uh, menstrual bleeding you had and uh, the quality of menstrual bleeding you will have after hysteroscopy. So my recommendation for sure, no doubt, is to make hysteroscopy, uh, make biopsy of endometrium, even if uh, your physician tells that everything is good, you should confirm it with the objective methods of morphological and immunohistochemical investigation. And if uh, uh, there is uh, chronic endometritis, maybe you uh, you will even not have chronic endometritis. You will have, um, for example, micro polyp, which doesn't uh, make any harm to your organism in whole, but uh, will diminish your chances for conception and for successful embryo transfer. Wonderful. Thank you so much again, of course, for yet another advice. Okay, let's have a look at the next question, okay? So I had stage two of chronic endometritis. I had one IVF attempt that failed and now have two frozen embryos. Should I implant both embryos or just one? Uh, could you please clarify if uh, those embryos were with pre-implantation genetic testing or not? And uh, at what age uh, these embryos were uh, produced? Yeah, if you can add that, that'd be great, okay? And we need to add. Will, uh, uh, give the response, okay? 
Okay, so uh, Irina, if you can let us know, okay, we will go back to your question. We just need, okay, someone is typing, so let's give it a minute. No genetic testing. And what age? Let's give it a second. I think she is typing. For 34. 34 years old it's a, it's a very good age um, we should also take into the account the quality of sperm because uh, if uh, there are some defects it's better to make the implantation genetic testing uh, and uh, even uh, uh, if you have two embryos uh, it's better to make pre-implantation genetic testing uh, my vision is always to you know sometimes less is more uh, I had some patients with multiple pregnancy, uh, some with natural, some with uh, artificial, because, uh, you know, 10 years ago, it was a normal routine practice. So when uh, we transferred two embryos uh, without pre-implantation genetic testing, I know that even now, for example, in Germany, uh, there is limitation not to transfer more than three embryos. So, and uh, we recommend to transfer just one. So my idea is that when we have created good conditions, uh, there is a very tiny difference between uh, success rate when we transfer two embryos or when we uh, transfer one embryo. Don't expect two a fold um, difference. For example, we transfer uh, one embryo, we have 50% of success and we transfer two embryos, we expect uh, 100%. No, uh, we never see it. The difference is just uh, several percents. So my idea is to prepare properly your uterus to investigate the embryos, uh, given uh, this fact that you are a very young woman, your, uh, the sperm of your husband, of your partner is also with good characteristics. I think that uh, you should pay more attention to the endometrium and to if you haven't uh, performed hysteroscopy, please make it. I know that uh, I repeat the same recommendation, but it just must, you know. Uh, when I started to uh, work with recount implantation failure, I thought that uh, all my cases will be with uh, uh, very unusual diseases, with very specific situations. But to say the truth, even... Uh, patients with multiple ineffective attempts. In most cases, uh, we should go through the specific algorithm, go through hysteroscopy, uh, pay much attention to the microbiome of endometrium or of, uh, window of implantation, assess and prepare good embryo, and everything will be good. Uh, there is no miracle. Everything is quite simple, which is, uh, should go through this and for sure trust to each other. Have you the next question? Uh, I will uh, tell everybody that or well, hysteroscopy and laparoscopy was already uh, performed and they confirmed endometriosis stage two. Uh, the next question: Have you performed treatment of endometriosis? According to this moment, uh, the golden standard and the first line for treatment of endometriosis is so-called tablets with Dianogist. It's a very comfortable medication. It works on all the points of pathological ways of uh, um, the mechanism of endometriosis. Uh, so for sure, you should treat this endometriosis. Please write down if you had already performed this treatment with endometriosis. Uh, well, uh, there is a risk when we defreeze, uh, uh, make biopsy and freeze once again uh, the embryos. Uh, given your good, uh, good age, uh, for sure, I also think that the problem is not associated with the embryos. I would recommend to transfer one embryo, but uh, to prepare more promptly uh, endometrium to pay more attention to uh, 
no, just a surgical stage of uh, treatment of endometriosis is not enough. Uh, according to all the guidelines, uh, treatment of endometriosis should be complex and include surgical stage and then uh, so-called conservative stage when we make uh, treatment uh, directed to against uh, regress, uh, uh, recidive of endometriosis, anti-recidive treatment. So for sure it's better to make this treatment. Thank you so much once again of course for your advice and of course Irina for your follow-ups and clarify clarification here it uh, made it a bit easier as well <laughs> right so as you can see there is a thank you from Irina for you Dr. Diana as always thanks okay let's go back to the previous questions that we got so let's have a look at this one I 31 AMH 2.9 nanograms closed tubes had four unsuccessful IVF attempts. The more I got stimulated, higher doses, the worse uh, results, less eggs, no fertilization. In the end, I have max only one to embryos BB quality on day three to transfer. Semen analysis, even DNA fragmentation are good. Egg donation is not an option for us. What can we do to achieve pregnancy with own material, even if we have just few embryos? Thank you for your question. Well, uh, from the first point, uh, for sure, after a May intense pregnancy week, we always expect uh, a kind of severe chronic endometritis. So for sure, uh, we expect problems with endometrium. But the first line, we should understand uh, why in such a good age uh, we have uh, diminished quality of X. In this point, uh, we should make a blood test on CA125 uh, to assess uh, if uh, there are some points for uh, endometriosis. Please pay uh, uh, attention that endometritis and endometriosis are different diseases. Uh, they are um, sound rather similar, but these are just two different diseases. And uh, endometriosis can affect and is it uh, we expect that it will it would affect the quality of x in this situation i would make pause i would make a break and uh, to for recover of your organism uh, make uh, another type of stimulation uh, if you send me because um, uh, I think we would share my email because I, I see that um, most of you have uh, specific certain uh, questions about your own personalized case. I, I'm ready to uh, provide my vision, my recommendation, but I have to take more information. Please send me your protocols, your reports from Embryo Lab. I would assess and uh, give my certain recommendations because uh, by this moment we have 19 types of uh, stimulations, 19. So what I want to say is that please don't give up. Uh, all of you, please don't give up. We do have a lot of instruments and means to help you. In this situation, I uh, think that we should find the reason why you know, there is a diminishing of the quality of X. Try to fix it. For sure, I would recommend to make a short pause at least three or four months. Uh, then to make a ovarian stimulation with another medication, with another regimen uh, to provide more X because AMH 2.9 is a good result. It's a it's a normal rate and the age is very good. So we expect to have a better result if we prepare promptly. Uh, to embryos, to embryos uh, on day three to transfer for sure is um, that situation for assessment because we even don't know if the 
embryos develop till day five. And that's why for sure we can uh, provide either problems associated with the endometrium or with the eggs. But you have two points to, to assess. For sure, the dramatic situation with a main 10 pregnancy week uh, could provide only bad outcome for uterus, but for sure we can fix it. It, uh, uh, there's no problem, we should just pay attention for that. For that. But uh, I would recommend and I'm in this to change the protocol of stimulation and to make a preparation and uh, a short break before another stimulation. Thank you so much indeed. And I want to ask, of course, for the for your email address. I will put it in the chat section in a minute. Okay. So anyone if you would like to get in touch with Dr. Diana, I will put the, your email there. Uh, so just give me a second. And let's go to the next question first. Um, of course, there's a thank you. Carolyn, just one question for uh, Anastasia. Please, when uh, you send me your data. Please, could you please send me also your FSH and LH level because I uh, wish to take into that account it, uh, the rates also. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. And as you can see, uh, she has added last time it was Pergoveris 300. Yeah. And there's a, okay, thank you from Anastasia here. I will put the email in a bit. So just give me a second. Let's go to the next question and I will do it. Um, okay, Dr. Diana, apologies, I must have missed it. What is the personalized embryo transfer? Personalized embryo transfer is, uh, well, uh, routine embryo transfer uh, can be performed uh, in fresh cycle on day five uh, after uh, egg retrieval or uh, as a frozen embryo transfer. If we make it as a frozen embryo transfer, because nowadays, um, in most cases, we performed uh, delayed and frozen both embryo transfer. Uh, we make embryo transfer also in a specific date. Usually, we make it five days after we start admin uh, after we start progesterone. So uh, we make the embryo transfer on day five or six of administration of progesterone. Uh, according to previous data, uh, we thought that um, it would be enough to, um, to create uh, receptivity in endometrium because it has a strong association with rate of progesterone and uh, length of uh, ad administration of progesterone. But uh, when started uh, profound investigations on topic of uh, window of implantation we got the information that only 65% uh, of women have standardized uh, time frames for uh, this window of implantation so i uh, i would remind that window of implantation is the time frames when uh, the process of embryo development and uh, 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 region of uh, maximum receptivity of endometrium are synchronized. So, as I have told, just 65% of women have these standardized time frames. In all other situations, in rest cases, uh, we have uh, some uh, situation when embryo, uh, when a window of, of implantation is delayed, in most cases is delayed, or it can be earlier than uh, these five days. That's why when we transfer embryo transfer, uh, uh, when we transfer the embryo inside the uterus and endometrium is not ready or is over, uh, uh, over maturated already, the, uh, this connection between embryo and uterus just doesn't occur properly and we see no result of our work, of our actions. So the idea is to make the trial preparation cycle and on the day when we wanted to make embryo transfer, we make biopsy of your endometrium 
we do not make embryo transfer of that cycle, but we investigate this sample of endometrium to assess and to uh, detect the perfect time for embryo transfer precisely for you. After that, the following cycle, we make embryo transfer not uh, according to standardized understanding and not on day five, but on the personalized time, perfect time for you. Uh, and it provides a great result, to say the truth. It do, uh, I think it's one of the instruments uh, which resulted in such a uh, high success rate in clinics uh, with personalized embryo transfer. Thank you. Thank you. As, of course, as always, thanks for the clear explanation. You can see it right here. Uh, there are a few questions left. We will be slowly finishing, okay, because tonight we are having another webinar at 8 p.m. UK time, but don't worry, okay? I will forward any of the questions that uh, we will not have time to answer. I will forward those to Dr. Diana and she'll get back to you, okay? Um, there are two questions on TSH, so let's get to those. What is your target con concentration for TSH and what is the TSH range that is optimum for fertility rather than medically for functional thyroid? Uh, this is a perfect, uh, a perfect question because according to all the international guidelines, uh, the normal range uh, of a TSH and normal rate is a 2.5 but uh, there are some papers that uh, demonstrate that it's better uh, to have it even lower so uh, we talk about so-called aim level when it's better to have from 1.5 till 2 uh, it's not the problem if uh, TSH is, is even lower than 1.5, but we start to make uh, so-called uh, prophylactic dosage of uh, a therapy when we have TSH 2.5 and higher. And then if it, because uh, we consider is uh, the risk to elevate just after embryo transfer. Wonderful. Thank you so much indeed. And now let's go to the previous question right here. It's a bit of a longer question again. So for, from Sarah, I had one unsuccessful donor egg transfer. I have only one healthy embryo left. I am healthy 47 and had a baby before. I have had two miscarriages before. My pelvic scan showed two fibroids that would not interfere with transfer. The clinic I am attending are suggesting a hysteroscopy to check there are no issues in the womb. Should I be asking for tests for microbiotic problems? I have found a clinic, but to be really good. But I am concerned it is our last chance. Well, uh, at first, please uh, uh, don't be afraid. I know I can relate that you're concerned, but for sure you have you have not the last chance. And uh, I think that you, you should fight uh, till the good result of your uh, work. For sure, after two miscarriages, if you remember our slide with chronic endometritis and the prevalence of chronic endometritis in group with recurrent pregnancy loss, unfortunately, we know that in most cases we uh, will observe chronic endometritis. That's why I totally agree with your physician and with the uh, with your clinic that it's better to make hysteroscopy to check, uh, and after that. Um, the, the one point I want not only just to make hysteroscopy and assess visually uh, the condition inside the, the uterus, we should take sample of uh, tissue in any situation because unfortunately we cannot assess it uh, during the procedure properly. We should make uh, take sample of uh, the endometrium and assess it in the lab. And for sure, I would uh, recommend you to, uh, to make a microbiotic test also, for sure, because uh, otherwise uh, we do not have uh, the full understanding uh, and we do not see the full pattern. 
then you will according to this result uh, you have to uh, your physician will prescribe you the plan for recovery for your endometrium and then you will make a successful embryo transfer i want to tell you that patients with uh, pregnancies and the anamnesis and their medical history even when we talk about miscarriages have better prognosis than unfortunately women with no pregnancy at all so please don't give up you have a good age 47 years old it's a good age please uh, don't uh, think uh, in another way you have enough time just don't give up Wonderful. Again, thank you so much indeed uh, for yet another great advice. And actually, Sarah has added something. I want you to have a look at it. Yes, they are going to take a biopsy. Thank you so much for your answer. You made my day. I won't give up. <laughs> Thanks so much indeed, Sarah. And fingers crossed. That's for sure. All right. Uh, still, we have some time. So let's have a look at the next question. I am very interested in guarantee program. You have the same pricing for Russian citizens and foreigner citizens. Uh, it's just quite different, but uh, it depends on all for the logistics because but the price is just the same. But for foreign citizens, we take responsibility for preparation uh, visa and, and specific invitation. You know, new norma for <laughs> coming to Russia, it's a bit, uh, and for traveling, it's uh, very new and rather challenging. But uh, we have the, these programs for everybody. So don't be afraid just uh, let me know and my manager will describe you all the details about pricing thank you for the clarification for this one as well okay how about can ivig harm chance of success uh, it was a rather popular and inspiring uh, several years ago uh, but uh, now it doesn't provide any harm. But to say the truth, uh, uh, we do not talk about great benefits from uh, IVIG. So it's a very, very small room for uh, implementation for IVIG. Uh, it's precisely APS syndrome uh, and some. Mm, very severe uh, autoimmune diseases. Uh, it doesn't provide any benefits uh, in routine practice for um, for a recurrent implantation failure. Could you tell me what autoimmune disease do you have? Because it it do it does differ. In your situation, yes, I would tell that it was uh, implementation. Don't be afraid. But uh, the thing is uh, that uh, the injection of IVIG should be performed only inside the clinic. Uh, because one patient from one country told me that uh, she's ready to make it at home. Please don't do it, it by yourself, only according to administration of your physician. Uh, there is no uh, data according precisely your disease and IVIG, but uh, given uh, the background of uh, your disease, uh, we could try to make an uh, as a additional therapy to enhance the chances to argue uh, for IVF treatment. Excellent. Thank you so much once more. Um, and as you can see, thank you from Nicola for you. All right, um, let's have a look. There are like three questions left. I think we will still be able to answer them. Still, uh, let's have a look at this one. I just did a microbiome test and it came back with 20% lactobacillus. What are your thoughts on this? Um, Enterobacter, you see, sorry, I'm not sure here, 77% and Gardnerla vaginalis. And you can see the rest are these worrisome. Uh, 
uh, that's what we uh, were talking about today that you see that normally uh, you should have lactobacillus uh, as a dominant uh, microorganism in your situation you have enterobacteria and gardnerella vaginalis for sure you should treat it and then repeat till we have a normal so lactobacillus dominant type of microbiome and i would recommend not to do embryo transfer till you have good result because it uh, uh, does uh, play a crucial role in our work also It means precisely that uh, dysbiosis is means uh, uh, abnormal uh, relationships between concentration of microorganisms because uh, in normal situation, uh, yes, lactobacillus are dominant, but there are plenty of microorganisms. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, talk, we uh, call it normabiosis when uh, lactobacillus are dominant and we have uh, aerobic or anaerobic uh, dependently of uh, which type of microorganism is dominant. In your situation uh, is a rather simple type of treatment. You should just uh, go through this and uh, check uh, after the treatment uh, to be sure that now you have uh, this fix uh, these uh, things done and you have normal type of microbiome it's not a big deal to say the truth but uh, we have to pay attention to this because when we just uh, forget about uh, basic things unfortunately they uh, return to us with bad results Oh, it's just normalization. We do not uh, increase lactobacillus. So we normalize the concentration. So uh, in your case, uh, we should uh, diminish antibacteria. And uh, lactobacillus is a normal type of uh, microbiome. So it will increase uh, just uh, correspondently to the normal flora. Unfortunately, I cannot just please send me all your because uh, uh, I never provide certain recommendations with specific medication when you ask just uh, uh, you know a brief uh, briefly such questions because I'm afraid that I don't have enough information to provide uh, good recommendations. Uh, it's better to uh, contact your physician who knows your. Uh, who knows you uh, well or just send me uh, all your data to assess it that makes perfect sense and of course uh, you can find the email address uh, right there in the chat section don't hesitate go ahead and do it I'm sure Dr. Diana will be happy to help um, and it looks that uh, that now will be our final question and if we have any left we will then I will then forward those to Dr. Diana, okay? Uh, we will be uh, starting soon our second webinar, so we will need to get going, but let's have a look. So following your answer about having a hysteroscopy, what would the endometrium biopsy be for? What would they be testing for? Thank you. Uh, just uh, the basic investigation is uh, morphological and immunohistochemical investigation. So it's a specific type of staining of uh, endometrium, of sample of endometrium to assess if uh, uh, there is uh, there are uh, CD markers of chronic endometritis or CD markers, uh, CD cluster D is markers of, uh, of uh, inflammation. According to uh, rate of these CD markers, we can uh, inter uh, give up interpretation about activity of inflammation and uh, thus provide uh, individualized treatment. Also, if uh, uh, we talk about uh, recurrent implantation failure, sometimes so we uh, make uh, also tests on uh, implantation window just at the same time or on microbiome it depends also on uh, facilities of clinic 
because uh, morphological and immunohistochemical chemical analysis should be done in each clinic but not all clinics are um, ready and have facilities to make error tests be ready test on implantation window or uh, test on microbiome so it also depends of uh, capacities uh, of the clinic And again, thank you so much indeed. And actually, I believe that was our final question. So thank you, everyone, for your incredible questions, for sharing your stories. And of course, Dr. Diana, as always, you've been brilliant with helping out all those um, to all those questions and, of course, your presentation. It's always great to have you back. And as you can see, there are some thank yous for your clear explanation and, of course, here, um knowledge in the field i really love your approach so what else can i really add but maybe you would like to add something before we finish yes uh thank you so much for your time uh for your strength uh i love my work for this interaction for this you know um interaction with the energy with people i admire my patient i admire women to face such problems and do not stop. I want to, you know, uh, inspire you a bit and tell you that nothing impossible is right now in our field. We do have enough opportunities and we do have enough uh, means to help you. But sometimes, uh, you know, we should make this fire of hope inside us uh, by ourselves. We are always very close. Me, we, I mean, uh, we are your physicians, not only, you know, in my clinic in St. Petersburg, your physicians we, who are very close in each of your clinics. Just uh, never give up. We are very close and we are ready to help you. We will do our best. Thank you. Thank you so much for adding this, yes. So you give this hope, you give this uh, amazing, amazing support. So huge thanks for that, Dr. Diana, as always. And as you can see, another thank you. What else can I add after that? Really nothing else to add. So thank you so much for joining again. And it's always brilliant to have you back. And I just want to let you know that Dr. Diana will be back, okay? In July, there's another um, webinar scheduled. So stay tuned, you are already able to sign up for that uh, webinar on IVF legislation in Russia as well. So um, yeah, thank you so much for tonight, uh, Dr. Diana, looking forward to our next event already. And just so you know, it has been recorded, so you will have a chance to watch this again on my Avi Fences. It will be available tomorrow and, of course, on our YouTube channel. So if you subscribe, that way you will be notified that it has been uploaded. And, well, if you have time and you are up for it, join us. We will start in 20 minutes. There is another webinar coming up on solo motherhood uh, with Mel Johnson. So if you would like to find out a bit more on how it all works, um, just go ahead, sign up. Thank you so much. Have a relaxing evening, nice. Dr. Diana. Thank you. See you soon as well. Thanks. Thank Bye.